Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about the visual shader language of Godot 3.2. Godot is an open source game engine, and among open source game engines, perhaps the one with the most mindshare. They are working on a 3.2 release soon, and among its features, it includes updates to the visual shader language and editing, editing capabilities of uh, the Godot engine. Here's a blog post from May and another one later that will give you a lot of summary of what the new features are. For those of you who aren't familiar with shaders, they are a way to write programs for your GPU or your graphics card to run in parallel. So for example, they have vertex shaders and fragment shaders. The vertex shaders control how the vertices of your 3D models get positioned and fragment shaders control how each pixel on the screen gets rendered to a color. And again, these run in parallel so that your uh, graphics get rendered quickly. Shader Toy is a great website to come learn about uh, how to do shaders. They use here a language called GLSL for the WebGL that runs in your browser. It looks a lot like C. And for example, you have a program that generates as a fragment shader uh, what looks like a world here and can even animate it. Here's another example of creating a planet using GLSL. And we're going to do a planet as well. It's not going to be as fancy as these examples because of time constraints and because of the fact that I'm not as awesome as the people who are making these shaders. So here we are in a brand new Godot project and I'm going to make a new 3D scene and I'm going to add a sphere to this scene to use for our planet. I'm going to make it a little bit more detailed so we can get a smoother world here. Notice also that this planet looks blue even though it's actually white. That's because by default in Godot when you create a new project you have a sky which is blue. I'm going to reset it to black. I'm going to create an ambient light which is white. Ambient light won't get us a lot of actual like you know shadow effect but that'll be good enough for our current needs. We don't really need those. So here's our world. Let's save it and let's make a new material as well to describe what our world looks like in a shader. Call it planet material. And let's go ahead and add this as the material for our planet. Okay, so here we are. We can go in and create a new visual shader to use here and start editing away. So here's a bunch of material properties that Godot has for its default rendering engine uh, for 3D, and we're only going to use albedo or color. Now I can add a new node for color either up here, I can also right click or drag out from an existing node in order to create a new one. I'm going to resize this so I can see a little bit better, and I'm going to search for color constant. So we get a little hello world version of a shader here, which is that's like a blue ocean. So now our planet is blue. Yay. And notice that this visual shader, which is in one language, gets converted by Godot into its own textual shader language, which will then get converted to whatever other things needed for your particular graphics engine. Anyway, so we see here our fragment shader has a color which is blue and set it to albedo, and that's the whole thing. Okay, back to our visual world. Now, in order to make a world like this, we need some noise to create the details of our planet. So instead of just using a color, let's go and create a noise texture. Noise texture, and create a new open simplex noise, and let's use that instead of the blue color. So we have some noise there. Now it's using UV by default as the input, which relates to the coordinates on top of these polygons. This is exactly what we want. We want to have 3D texture, so we're going to want to have a 3D input, which we can do using this vertex input, which is a 3D coordinate. However, this 3D coordinate is in view space, so whatever our view is, that's not changing relative to the world, and so it's not really what we want to have happen. We want to have a coordinate in model space where this sphere is the planet that's our model. And we can look at the documentation here in Godot where you can see that what we want to use is a camera matrix to get from view space to world space. And our world space, if we invert it, will go from world to model, which is our planet. So let's go ahead and get to that camera in there. Copy and paste with control C, control V. And we can do a camera transform and then add a new node to apply the transform, transform vector molt. So what we can do here is take our view space coordinate and change it into world space, which is the global coordinate system for our whole scene. Now if you notice here, all of a sudden we have a change and we change our view, we change what we're seeing. But this, like I said, is in uh, world space, which is the global coordinate system for our scene. 
And so our world is changing its position in the scene, and so therefore the way the texture gets applied gets changed as well. We don't really want that. Uh, we want to get it again, get it in model space where our sphere is the model in question. So to do that, we're going to have a new transform. Copy and paste these here. You can do Control click to multi select. Middle click drag to pan my view of the visual shader in this case. And I'm going to want to use the world transform, but I need to invert it to go from world to model instead of model to world. So let's do an inverse here. By the way, if you're not familiar with linear algebra, don't stress out too much. Think about what I'm saying they mean. Behind the scenes, there's all kinds of math, but it doesn't really matter a whole lot for our current needs. If we take our uh, world space coordinate and our global coordinate system and go to our model space instead, we now didn't see so far, but if we now if we change our x or our y position, now it stays constant. So here we have a texture applied in model space. However, it's a two-dimensional texture, which is why it doesn't change with the z coordinate here. And that's not really what we want. What we really want to have is a 3D texture and not a 2D texture. And luckily there's an easy way to do this because another new feature of Godot 3.2 is visual shader plugins, where you use a textual uh, representation in order to create new kinds of nodes that then can be used visually. And conveniently for us, the example they give in the documentation is a 3D noise texture. So I'm going to go and add here a new script, which I'm going to call Noise 3D. Let's go ahead and edit this. I'm going to select and replace what I just copied and pasted from the browser. And we see in our mini map here, all this yellow text is global code that will get added to the final shader text only one time, no matter how many times we've used this new node we're defining. Uh, what we use instead, each time you define a node, it runs this, it applies this git code to apply any particular usage of this new custom shader node. Anyway, I only want two inputs. And instead of a 2D input, I want a 3D input. So I'm going to call it XYZ. And I also want a scale here. I'm going to call it freak for frequency because I want to control the frequency of the of this noise. In other words, uh, how much detail we have. We'll look at that more in a minute. So here are my two inputs. We have a vector, which is XYZ, and a scalar, which is freak. And now I want to change a little bit how this is being used down here. I just want to take my XYZ and multiply it by my frequency. And I only have two inputs now instead of four. So now I've modified that example we got from the documentation. I can go back to my 3D view and go back to my material, and I can add it now. Now, one of the things we actually had here, just quickly, sorry, coming back over here, we had a category and we had a name for this defined as well. If we go back to our 3D view and our uh, shader, we can uh, see this show up here. If we remove the search, and our my shader knows is Perl and Noise 3D, it automatically got discovered by the Godot editor. We can also just drag it out here from our resources. So let's use this XYZ and let's use a constant frequency of one for now. This is good enough for our needs as well. And let's use this instead of, oops, let's use this new 3D noise instead of the 2D noise we had before. So now here we see we have a 3D noise, but not a lot of detail to it. It'll be a little more interesting once we change the colors. So instead of saying black and white, let's use blue and green. This sort of represents an elevation level, and we're going to have our lower elevations be ocean and our higher elevations be forest. So let's go in ahead and add a new texture, which is a gradient texture. And we'll need to add a new gradient, which by default is also just going to be black and white. So let's switch over to our new one here. Not terribly exciting so far. Let's change these colors. Let's make a blue ocean. I'm not all that great at color choice, but I'll, you get what I get. And as we can change how that gets applied, let's also choose a green color for forests. Let's call that good for now. We can change where that gets applied as well. So I can have more land or more ocean, depending on how I control this gradient. We can also control how fuzzy it gets in the middle by how close these two get together. And you can imagine doing other kinds of gradients for other needs. That's a little bit too much land. Let's add a little more water instead. So we have some continents here. 
Uh, so I'm sort of happy with this level of detail. So we have some continents on our planet, but not a lot of detail. We could add more detail by increasing the frequency, but this is pretty noisy. It's not really what I want to be seeing on my world. So let's make a combination of the two. This is called octaves in our noise. Let's start with continent level. Let's make sure that our world space coordinate is going into both of these. And so I can switch from the content level, which is frequency one, to detail level, which is frequency four. At least what I really want is a combination of the two. I don't want one or the other by itself. So let's compose these into a single vector so we can do some weighted averaging of them. So we're going to call the content level x, we're going to call the detail level y. Move these over here to give ourselves some more space. And then I can use a dot product, which is going to be a weighted sum for our purposes of these two features. So we're bringing that in as our input. And then we can say, for example, we want 50% continent, 50% detail. We put a 5-5. Five, five. So I hit, hit the Enter button. And if we drag that in instead, now we have a combination of the continent and the detail level. And I don't like this combo, a little too much archipelago to me. So I'm going to do about 70% continent and about 30% detail. Now to me, this is somewhat of an interesting set of continents and details to those continents. And we can imagine doing other things as well in our, link, in our uh, shader here. We can imagine using our world space coordinate. Let's zoom out a little bit to see better. Imagine using our world space coordinate in order to uh, control the, la uh, the latitude. And in combination with our elevation, maybe we could put ice caps on or any number of other things to make it cool like those other examples we saw previously. Notice also that we can organize these things as well. So for example, I can go select all these things that determine our model space coordinate, move them over here. These things that determine our elevation level and put it over here. And this, that we can do a little bit of visual grouping here. Notice also that when we're talking about these visual languages, it's quite different from a textual language. In a textual language, it's sort of a natural flow from top to bottom, for example, that sort of defines an order of evaluation. In our visual language, we don't really have that. We have more of a dependency graph, which is sort of like, say, a make file. And so it's not necessarily defined an order here. Does, does the uh, content level or the detail level happen first? It doesn't really matter. They just both depend on these other previous calculations. And so not only do we have sort of a lack of inherent uh, ordering other than the dependencies, we also have a natural functional programming language here as well where there's, we're not so concerned with side effects as we are with the values. And so really this uh, visual language is naturally uh, applied to being a functional language as well. And meanwhile, in terms of the grouping we saw here previously, it'd be nice if I actually could group these together. And there is a dis uh, proposal for Godot to add grouping of various sorts. They've been discussing it some, but there's no current milestone for when they're planning to implement it. That'll be nice when it comes along so I can organize things further as well. Anyway, I hope we get to talk more about data parallel and or visual languages in the future, and I hope it's been fun. Bye, y'all.